Hi everybody. We're doing a sensory processing video today to just review for you what I expect from the class, um, the class to accommodate. Sorry for my blah, 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 trying to get it going in the beginning. So um, I've gone over this with the students so they kind of have an idea of what they're looking for and um, trying to get the teachers to understand exactly what we're looking for for them and also to try to um, all get a common language so we understand if the child is needing something. Um, I'm really looking at this in terms of how we can adjust the classroom routines things have things available what they can request and when it's okay and in good ways of that they can request that in the classroom really concretely so that they know they can meet their needs as much as they need to so first of all what is sensory processing sensory processing is the ability of the body to take in information through the various organs that that we'll discuss later um, send it to the brain, the brain processes it, and then it, it sends out a response, some sort of response. It could be a motor response, it could be a visual response, it could be a, your mouth watering or your um, going to the bathroom. But you, some sort of response from listening to the different parts of the body that you have coming out. Oops. Um, so a good example I have here is if you smelled cookies baking. So if the kids, the kids like this example because usually when you have a, a smell that's associated with something positive, they um, become, they might have like, um, maybe they're, uh, they, they recognize that it's cookies. This is going on in the brain. They're recognizing that, oh my gosh, that smells like chocolate chip cookies. And then the response is maybe their mouth is watering. Maybe they say, I'm going to get up and go check with mom what she's cooking. Something right here would be the response. So the input would be the, the, the nose taking the information in. Hey, it smells like cookies. That's the brain going, hey, it smells like cookies. And then you go into the response of whether they're going to, asking mom whether they're going to eat it, if they're going to, um, to um, take bigger sniffs if their mouth is starting to water because they can't wait to eat those cookies. So the different types of sensory input that they might have is smell. Um, there's not a lot we can change with smell, but some smells are offensive for the kids in the classroom. So um, uh, it's that's one area that we can kind of address, you know, have scented air fresheners or something in the classroom if it's if there's something offensive to them. Um, sometimes I notice that too with photocopies, like you'll catch kids smelling them. Auditory, limiting distractions, um, understanding when kids have hear more than the average child. Um, that's the case with some of my students at Arbor. They might hear things going on two rooms down the hall. Vision. Are they um, taking the information in? Are they letting the information go out? How are they able to interact visually with those things in their output? Um, touch. This one is very common. People are often sensory defensive. Um, they don't like to be touched. Um, and they may actually um, have issues with um, other students over the fact that, hey, he's touching me. That can be more than just a behavior. If the, the touch is uncomfortable to them, then they might actually react with a greater response than you would expect from a simple, gentle touch. Um, taste isn't something we address all that much, but some kids have food aversions and that may be something that would affect them. Um, this, these are the areas, oh, these two are the areas that OT looks at a lot because these areas everyone kind of knows a little bit about, but the three big ones OTs look at are tactile, vestibular, and proprioceptive. Vestibular is measured actually in your inner ear, and you have these little bones that float in a liquid, and 
basically when you bend your head forward, backward, side, side, spin, all them, uh, those bones in the inner ear floating in that liquid tells, sends information to your brain to tell you where your head is in space. So then tells your body, which when the brain registers where your head is in space, it then sends it back out to your body to um, have them be able to respond. Um, a lot of kids who rock, who pace, who move back and forth when they're talking to you, these are kids that need more vestibular input. And there's sometimes kids that respond to vestibular input with an over response. These are kids that might need less vestibular input or might need a little extra time after recess or gym or riding the bus to calm their bodies down. Um, proprioceptive is um, how much your muscles and um, your muscles and joints are flexing and contracting. The muscles and joints take that information in sends to the brain, hey, my arm is bending this far. Oh, that's not far enough. You need to go further to go to your head. So that's, that's what it's doing. Um, those are, again, the receptors are in your muscles and joints. They send the information to the brain. And then the brain sends information back to the muscles and joints, telling them how far to move in order to be able to complete a task. And the last one is interceptive, which is um, what's going on inside your body. Um, this is also called interoception, and basically, um, a good example is if a child needs to go to the bathroom. So inside their body, you know, in their belly, they're starting to feel something. And then how they respond to that feeling um, is something that actually occurs a lot in school as a problem because some kids don't like to have, like, if they have to have a bowel movement, they might not like to go have a bowel movement in the school. And then they might hold it. And then they might be moody because they're holding it and they need to go. So it's something that, that we're just starting to realize how important it is to look at that and include in sensory processing. Um, and it's something that's the hardest for us to tell what's going on with the kids because unless they can verbalize it um, and feel comfortable and safe in verbalizing it, it's an area that's hard to communicate um, with a child about. So children usually fall under the category of under-responsive, just right, or over-responsive. Now, every child at some point will over respond to something. Like say they ate too much candy. You know, you might see them being acting all fidgety. Um, say they've um, run a long race. They may be then unable to do anything more and then they may be under responsive after that race. Um, but usually there's enough input in a child's day where they kind of bounce back and forth close to just right all day long. So in the school day, um, we'll talk about it later, but as they move, like say they're in gym, they might lean towards this way and then they go back to class and they might be here for a little while, but then if they get tired, they might bounce over here. So we wanna to try to keep them right in the middle, bouncing back and forth between just right. Now, a child who most of the time is under-responsive needs more sensory input to become just right. A child who is over-responsive needs a calmer, quieter presentation of whatever work you might be giving them because they may over-respond to it. The problem in school is you may have both in your classroom, sitting there at the table at the same time. And that's really difficult to manage. Um, so the goal is to teach the kids what might be a compensation strategy that they can use if it's going to be a little loud for a little while. Or if um, they um, are doing something and um, that is, I'm trying to think, that is very quiet, but they haven't 
had enough movement in a while. So say they're supposed to be sitting and doing work, but they are um, being very fidgety. Uh, a lot of times you might think that's over responsive, but the kids who are fidgety are moving because they, they need more input in order to stay focused, sometimes giving them a break on an exercise ball um, to, or an exercise ball to sit on, giving them a break by taking a walk, saying, hey, why don't you get a drink of water and come back? That might be a way that they can, they can increase to just right so that they can sit and be quiet, but they might need a little intervention there. Okay, so OT, we look at these skills in this kind of hierarchy to identify problem areas. Um, so basically the central nervous system takes in information and develops up into the real basic sensory inputs. The most basic sensory inputs are the tactile, the vestibular, and the proprioceptive inputs. We also get all these things through these areas, but oftentimes these things don't necessarily affect, um, uh, affect your uh, ability to learn in the classroom. Notice that academic learning is way up here. So these often don't, um, but this is smell, this is vision, this is hearing, and this is taste. Then here is where we build in motor skills. Do they have the postural security? Do they have core strength to be able to do what they need to do? Can they use the right side of the body with the left side of the body in a smooth manner? And can they motor plan? If you give them, say, stand up and go throw this away in the garbage, do they um, slide their chair over there because they missed the first step because they only heard the second thing? Or do they, um, are they missing, that's some, some, are they missing some part of the direction so that they can do it? There's another area of motor planning where they never actually take in the idea of what they're supposed to do. And those child, children might just sit there. Body scheme is your bo body awareness. Um, Reflexes, as if they are, you know, are your reflexes integrated and used in your body properly? And are they um, ability to filter out the information that's needed so that they can um, make a response to uh, sensory input? Then we go into perceptual motor, and you pretty much know what eye hand coordination is. Um, can their eyes move to, in order to be able to interact with an object? And um, do they have the postural adjustments to interact with that object? Auditory language skills that go along well along with motor planning is are they taking that, that the information in? Um, and are they able to use that information on the way out, you know, communicate on the way out? Um, visual spatial perception is can they, are they seeing how far away from them something is so that they can um, then interact with it? Um, and attention, this is whether they're actually able to um, attend to the, the cognitive skill of attending. Um, you know, there's a lot of executive functions that can go along this area, such as dividing your attention or alternating your attention. Um, these are areas that a lot of our kids do struggle with. Um, and that's a learned skill, is something that they need to practice. And sometimes we can't. Um, expect them to do it if they're at a lower level of attention. If they can follow one step directions, that goes back to motor planning, um, but they can't follow, follow three step directions, then we got to limit the way we, the amount of directions we give them at one time. Daily living activities is self-care. Can they do, follow their routine and do they understand it and are they able to just move through it? Behavior, Again, this is an area that we address a lot um, and tends to be a result of a lot of this. So you have to have the strong support in these things to be able to have good behavior. And if they don't have strong, strong support in all these areas, then behavior is going to be affected in some way. Um, 
and then of course academic learning is at the very top so we have to have a strong basis in all of this to be able to do what we need to in school and um, that's why we see kids okay so this this is just right this line this green line in the middle so I want you to think of that as that just right person and we're thinking about how the school day goes. Now I have an example down here and all my students told me they were walkers, so I should have walk here too. But anyhow, um, when they wake up, their energy level is really low. They're probably below just right. They're kind of under responsive. And then they start to eat a little breakfast and then they go, um, they go get dressed. Sometimes they shower in the morning, which might be a spike up to just right because that tends to make kids a lot more alert. And then they pack up their stuff and they go to school. And when they arrive at school, everybody's there and they're talking at the same time and they have to move and they have to do everything. So their energy level may even spike up here like this. It was hard to make this slide. So it spikes up here like this, and then suddenly um, they have to sit and do some math. So it goes down here, and then maybe even down, maybe even go down a little bit below, and then it's time for gym. We're gonna go way up here for gym. And then it goes down for, um, goes down for language arts. And then we have lunch, which is probably somewhere around here, because they got all that social, all that sound, all that movement, and then recess. And then, you know, language arts, we're going to go down here because we really don't want to do that at times. But, oh, I like that. They're, we're doing something fun. And so we, we tend to have ups and downs through, throughout the school day. And that there's times that would be way up here. A child who is over responsive may need to sit and do like a fine motor manipulative task that's preferred for a little bit to be able to stay at just right for them their next class. Those are the kind of modifications that I'm looking to see how we can implement within your classroom. Okay, so the goal of this, this information um, video is that I want to teach parents, teachers, and the child how to identify and communicate their needs. So first, everybody needs to understand that this is really a thing, that sometimes the kids have difficulty with this, and that that we need to all understand that so that we can provide them with the support that they need to participate in the school day. Um, the daily routine, you guys are awesome at this. Um, I've had some great conversations with my parents and I've had great conversations with the teachers. Having the daily routine, usually in a visual, in a, um, and, and con having consistency with that, um, and communicating when there is changes in that is really one of the best supports that kids have. Um, that's sometimes why they like coming to school so that they can, um, they can, f oh, what happened? Sorry. So that they can feel um, like they have that structure. Um, I've been talking to parents a lot now that we've been home for the COVID-19 um, issues, been talking to them a lot because about having that structure in the day because the kids really start to lose some of that. Um, sorry about that. Um, the other thing is um, identifying what input is overwhelming to a child. A lot of times um, they can tolerate smells, they can tolerate tastes, um, they can tolerate um, that usually doesn't bother them. But a child might be particularly overwhelmed by sight, like um, videos. Videos might make the kid ask you like a million questions. Or they can hear too much sound in the, in the um, building. I have one student who keeps telling me they heard something and I'm like, I can't hear it. And then I'll walk out, the, out into the library outside of the OT room and I'll be like, oh yeah, someone's doing something there. So, Understanding that they may hear more than us, they may be distracted by vision um, more than they might be distracted by sound. Knowing which one is the strength. Oh, if they're distracted by vision, then me giving them visuals might not be helpful. Or distracted by sound, then maybe we want to use more visuals. Um, touch. 
Is something offensive to them? Do they need more touch throughout the day? And when I mean touch, I mean like interaction. If things, um, you know, it might be a stretch. Maybe they have a moment that they need to stretch their body so that they can feel where their body is in space. Um, another idea is vestibular movement. Can they, will going for a walk help them to be able to take that next test? And if so, how can we fit that within our day? And proprioception, again, I'm looking at, can we include some exercises? Can we put a mat in the classroom? Can we use exercise ball in the classroom as intermittent things throughout the day that children can request because they need it to be able to pay attention, because they need it to stay in that just right. These are the modifications I'm looking for to see what could be just right. So I really wanna put a plan in place for the whole classroom. I really would like to know what you already have in place in terms of some of these things because teachers are wonderful about um, setting up a classroom so that the children can be just right learners. But um, for some, some of my kids that are just coming on or I'm just doing modifications for, I wanna kind of think of how we can build that in specifically for that child. So that way we can make those adjustments as needed um, and that the child can feel comfortable communicating with you that yes, I, I, I'm really feeling fidgety right now. I don't know what's going on. Um, can I go stretch in the corner for a few minutes? And that become the norm in your classroom and that be absolutely okay and that, all the kids have that opportunity. I don't think it's just the kids that need evaluation by OT that need to move. Um, I'll tell you one more story. I know this is a long video, but I'll tell you one more story is that I was this child. I was um, under responsive and I needed to move all the time when I was a kid um, or I could not pay attention. And my mom realized I was like this, but didn't know what it was. But she just said, hey, I think she needs to move um, more. And she put me on in swimming lessons. And when she put me on these swimming lessons, I was like in heaven. I was getting tons of vestibular. I was getting tons of, of proprioceptive. I had the water touching me. I heard the sound of the water in my ears. You know, it tasted chlorine, but you know what I mean? That type of things that all that sensation that I got for that period of time was what I needed to be able to learn in school. And you could look at my grades and you could tell when swimming season was in and when swimming season wasn't in. Um, and one last story is my son, very much like me, also was like that. Um, my oldest son, he, he, um, now he's a weightlifter. He taught himself how to unicycle. He rides a giraffe unicycle. It's something that we can include in our day in and outside of school. So that way we can, we can learn how our bodies are working and interacting with the world. My younger son tends to be over responsive. He doesn't like lots of sounds. He doesn't like the, um, the scratching of pencils when he's writing. He doesn't like all that input all the time. And sometimes some of that needs to be limited. So we've always had to, to make some adjustments in my house so that everybody's sensory needs are met. But at the same time, that's part of life. And we need to understand our own bodies so that we can communicate to others what we need. So that's what I'm hoping that the children will be able to learn and how we can support them in this classroom and at home. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch my video. Bye.